Welcome to the Last in Line podcast, where we discuss faith, hope, and truth in the lives of amazing servant leaders. You are in the right place if you crave purpose and if you hunger for a life of significance. This podcast applies biblical truth to our daily lives, and we pray that you walk away encouraged and inspired. This is the Last in Line podcast. Hey, gentlemen, I'd like to welcome our guest, Kyle Winkler. To Last in Line podcast. He is a Bible teacher. He has a master's in divinity in biblical studies from Regent University. He's been on TBN. He's been on the 700 Club Interactive Life Today. He's an author. He's a teacher. He's a preacher. Um, he's an app creator of an app called Shut Up Devil, which is a practical tool to help Folks engage in the battle of spiritual warfare and to dispel lies that the enemy tends to lean on to distract us. And he gives us practical tools and applications for engaging in that war. Uh, Kyle is no relation to the one and only Arthur Fonzarelli or Henry Winkler. That's a joke we had off air, but I thought I would share that with you. Uh, Kyle's story is pretty interesting. He uh, suffered from uh, nearly debilitating shyness as a kid. Um, he grew up in a liturgical home where rules and regulations and religion and rituals were a common practice. And some of his early life was scarred with rejection and loneliness, um, being misunderstood. At age 16, he finally experienced God and came to know Jesus Christ and uh, really developed an intimate faith, which led him on a journey to pursue really uh, knowing who God is, his love that requires no merit, which is grace. As you know, he understood mercy, he understood forgiveness and, and grace, like I said, and, and really began to unpack that in his life where he realized Yes, faith without works is dead, but I'm not needing to strive so hard to earn God's acceptance or to be this quote-unquote good Christian that he likes to call the good Christian syndrome. Kyle uh, offers some insight from his new book uh, called Permission to Be Imperfect, and we talk about his app, we talk about the book, we talk about some of his favorite aspects of writing this book and some of the things he was challenged with along the way. So hopefully you guys will come away knowing more about God, knowing more about your purpose, your mission, and that it does not require religion. It does not require rules. It does not require you striving to earn anything. Jesus paid for that, and Kyle does a good job explaining what most of us already know, but putting it in a way that allows us to walk in a new kind of freedom. So with that, help me welcome Mr. Kyle Winkler to Last in Line Podcast. Kyle Winkler, man, it's great to meet you. Great to have you on Last in Line Podcast. Welcome, sir. Ah, honored to be with you, John. Thanks so much. Man, we got a lot of hungry Christian dudes out here listening that are Love eager that. to learn and grow. And actually, I think most of them are eager to be challenged and maybe even convicted. Mm. The Holy Spirit's guiding uh, in a direction, maybe hey, maybe tapping them on the shoulder. And we're going to use you as a vessel to do that. So <laughs> All congrats right. and you're welcome. Oh, well, thank you. Yeah, it it, it is an honor truly to um to be used by God in, in that way. So yeah. Um, well, yeah, I pray that he does hungry people. I love that. I, I apologize in advance for the dry sarcasm that I might come out <laughs> with here. Cause that's I'm in good company me, but, then, or you're in good company. I like that, <laughs> but I love the work your dad did in happy days. Um, that <laughs> was a great show. I loved it. Um, no, might be your grandfather at this point. I, mean, I don't know how old. <laughs> so, sometimes I I do tell people that. Uh, yeah, uh, I have told people before in in joking that he's my uncle, but uh, I won't lie to you all. Yeah, yeah, the yeah. Fonz. Yeah, everybody on this on in this audience will know who that is. I think we're all a little a uh, <laughs> little more seasoned professionals. Yeah, I I find that the younger crowd isn't getting it anymore, but but the uh my uh -huh. age and above seems to still be on track with it. But yeah, yeah I, no relation that I know of, but Winkler is a unique enough last name that I think uh somewhere yeah. down the line I'm sure it goes back to Germany and I know he does yeah. too. So Okay. 
Yeah. I was going to guess Germany. All right. Mark that yeah. on the list. I should play Jeopardy probably. Um, <laughs> I'm that good. Okay. <laughs> Man, talk a little bit, because we're going to talk about your book that just came out, uh -huh. um, Permission to Be Imperfect, which I mm -hmm. thought was interesting. Um, how to Strive Less, Stress Less, and Sin Less. Um, I'm yeah. all about all three of those, by the way. The strive part, I think we might need to unpack some for the list. Yeah, let's do it. Because we got a lot of strivers out there, a lot of oh, fast yeah. runners, hard charging you know, guys running after that, whatever that thing is. But before yeah. we go into that, man, let us know um, maybe a little bit about your growing, uh, like kind of, kind of some of your childhood, more more like teen and early college yeah. type. Uh, how did you become a Christian? Like, are you, you know, womb to tomb type of thing? Or you was <laughs> it a was it a you know crack overdose in, in Harlem? <laughs> I mean, I don't know. Talk to me about how you came to Jesus. Yeah, well, I, I was raised uh, in a very liturgical tradition, and so uh, I always believed in God as long as I can remember. I think, though, I there were a lot of struggles going all the way back to potty training. Basically, it's where I take mm -hmm. it from me. But mm -hmm. I was, I was, I'm still a natural introvert, but I was very debilitatingly shy almost back then. That actually, in elementary years, they thought I had a reading problem because they called me to read aloud and I would just freeze up. And so that plays into my story because nobody wanted to be friends that, with the kid that didn't talk and I didn't have the confidence to pursue friendship. So I was the loner and the outcast and the one chosen last and called a bunch of names and all that, you know, the things that kids say when they don't understand you. And so going into junior high then in high school, there was just this, this feeling in me that there's something wrong with me. And then it kind of morphed into this identity of shame, really, that I am someone who is wrong. So even though I was attending church like several times a week, really, because I went to a, a religious church school as well. So I was inundated with at least that that version of Christianity at the time, which was very stoic and very just, you know, ritualistic and and things like that. Still, there was there's so much about me that I thought that God couldn't love and was mad at and things that needed to be fixed. So then I'm introduced to a faith that has power and practicality at 16 years old. And that's what I consider my salvation or born again moment. That's when I really understood Jesus as having died for my sins and all, all of that he did in a real personal way. Mm -hmm. But what happened as I guess the new wore off and nobody really explicitly told me to do this, but I think that with all the stuff in me that I felt was wrong with me, I think I, took to the faith over time as more of a spiritual self-help program. And I turned to the Bible as not much more than a book of instructions and principles to help grow me up and fix me up and change me up so that maybe I could earn God's grace. I could earn God's love that I could, I could maintain it. And it would then all of these do's and don'ts and disciplines and things would, would change me, uh, from all of these things about myself that I hated in many ways. And so the faith did heal me in many ways, but that's really getting ahead of myself. It just didn't do it in the way that I thought. It didn't come from all of the rules and all the disciplines and all of the striving. And that's really where this book, really where my ministry is at today. It, mm. it really came from learning how to rest in the love of God and learning how to mm. allow myself to be loved who I am as I am and letting God do whatever he's going to do from there. Yeah. Well, okay. How many books have you written? To this, this is my point? fourth one now. Fourth yeah. book. And for those of you not watching, like if, I encourage you, I, I mean, I'm with you. I, I listen more than I watch podcasts, but if you're driving or whatever, pull over and, or later look at this on Spotify or YouTube because he's got one of the cooler backgrounds and studios <laughs> that I think we've had um, on the show in four years. Uh, I love it. it. It's awesome. And I'm not going to tell you what it is because you have to go look <laughs> at it. Um, but all right. So you, you had to sort of snap out of that hypnosis yeah. of religion, yeah, good way to put it. religion mm -hmm. then, and got, got into more of an interaction, a dialogue relationship that people call it with, with a savior that really meant it for you personally. Yeah. And, and, and uh, I think yeah. that's, it's a good way you put it with the hypnosis and the, and the snapping out of religion because 
I had gotten caught up into it in both of the different kinds of Christianity that I, that I was born in, you know, there was religion surely mm-hmm. with that, which was based on rituals, which mm-hmm. had me in its own hypnosis for a while. And then even after I was saved, I tended back towards, and I think people do this, is mm-hmm. the mind tends to forget grace, and we tend back towards do to get, achieve to succeed, achieve to succeed, yeah. prove to please. And so I had to snap out of that too. So, yeah. so whichever brand of Christianity you're in, nobody is immune to this thing. It's mm-hmm. such a good point you made yeah. there. Well, uh, and and I think we all relate, like whether, regardless of our background, I think there's ebbs and flows in the Christian mm-hmm. walk. And I talk about progressive sanctification all the time. We're never really going to get to a destination, right, until we go to heaven. And and But I think, you know, this is just a life of school of hard knocks is really what this is. And with an enemy, to your point of, mm-hmm. The yeah. app that I want to talk about that's called Shut Up Devil, um, which I love it. There's so much good practical tools in there for people on the fly to just engage in battle. And my listeners will know I talk about spiritual warfare and fighting an enemy all the time. And mm-hmm. it's a matter of us owning that battle, that fight, that daily war that that's going on and just engage and get in the face of it, right? And um sounds like that's what you're doing. You want to give somebody some tools to to be more equipped, and I love it. Um, now, you do some speaking as well. Um, so going through this journey, like before you became an author, before you were an app creator, would you say you had any... I don't, I, I mean, I use it a lot, so I can't say that I actually hate it, but I, I dislike it that I use it so much, but defining <laughs> moment. Okay. Yeah, that term yeah. is so thrown around, but was there oh, yeah. any, I don't know, dark, how dark did it get if ever, or like going up through high school and college, like, were you kind of at a point of <clears throat> ever questioning fate? Your oh fate? yeah. Yeah. For sure. And it's, it, um, there are various defining moments. I mean, one, one came early on after I was saved, which was a a positive thing. I mean, I, I went into this new faith head first. I mean, I wanted like pour it all on me, Jesus. I mean, I was going in as deep as I could get and I was starting to discern a call to something, to ministry. I had a technology background. I was a computer programmer professionally, even in high school. And that was my degree in college even. But I, 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 I started to have this sense there in, in latter high school after shortly after I was saved that I was going to pursue ministry in some way, though I didn't know it would turn into this or it would be this message necessarily, but I knew something. And then there was a prophetic word that came forth Mm -hmm. to me. I went to a church called Grace Church, and at one point, I think it was my first exposure to something ever like this, and this traveling guy came through, and he stood me up in the back of the church and said, you're going to be the Grace Church yacker. And that was so opposite of where I was, because as I said, I was uh, introverted and very shy. And so... I'm like, well, this is opposite of where I am, but I chose to believe mm. it. But that, I think, also started the, okay, if I'm going to be this thing that God is, I believe God is saying that I'm going to be, then I've got to work on myself a whole lot in order to prove to him that I can handle this and that I can be this, that i got to mm-hmm. earn this position with him. And I think that put me down the road. And so I would say it all came kind of to a head. Mm-hmm. of the religion and all the striving came to a head shortly after college. I'm in my mid-20s, and I had done everything that I know to do spiritual-wise. All the spiritual jumping jacks is how I put it. Yeah. All the fasting strategies and the prayer strategies and the 10 steps to deliverance. And mm-hmm. I was working in a church. I was serving in a church every day of the week. Monday was spiritual growth seminar. Tuesday was advanced Bible study. Wednesday was a youth group leader. Thursday, small group. Friday, intercessory prayer. Then the weekend services. Trying all of these things to experience the victory that, mm-hmm. you know, I believe that the Bible yeah. says that we should have. And in many ways, I was feeling worse, not better. And so I didn't go the route that some people go of drugs and alcohol and yeah. sex, but I think I went to just as toxic things, mm. overachievement, perfectionism, and religion 
and I worked them all until I realized that while they can maybe hide things, they can't heal things. And so I get to this point shortly. I, I mean, really, I'm getting ready to step out for ministry because I think that I have something. I'd been working for a ministry for five years by that point. I'd gone to seminar, seminary, like yeah. I said, done all the things to do. Mm -hmm. Not necessarily bad things, but definitely nothing that can prove anything to God or prove yourself. Mm -hmm. And so I'd done all the things to do when I'm just hit with this, this, I would consider it like a demonic war on my mind is, mm -hmm. is really what it was. And it, it was this nagging voice that lasted for like a week in my head, at least bringing up my every sin that I could remember and mm -hmm. just saying that. I'm not good enough. Look what you've done. God can't use you as one of the things. Walk away, shut it all down, do something else. So that was kind of the the moment where, I mean, I was beat to tears. Yeah. And in that moment, though, you know, God doesn't leave anybody just to be the devil's doormat is how I like to say mm -hmm. it. And he pursued me in that moment. And he pursued me with a fresh revelation of the finished work of Christ. And what what I saw was a was the verse from John the Baptist in John 1, 29, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. So that just kind of ushered me into this 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 moment where it was like I was at the cross and I was I was yeah. seeing the finished work of Jesus, seeing him beaten, battered, and bruised for my sin, and then hearing those final words, it is finished. And it was just this revelation of, you know, if, if Jesus died for my sin and he said it is finished, then it is really finished in my life. And I don't need mm -hmm. to keep beating myself up. There's nothing more to disqualify me. I'm good enough because of Jesus. And that was the moment, John, when mm -hmm. I stood up, mm -hmm. said, if the enemy is going to come against me again, I'm going to say, shut up, devil. Right. So that's where the app came. That's where my fir first book, Silent Satan, came out of. And that's really what launched my ministry. I thought I had one message, but then I ended up getting... God's message for me. And here I am 10 years later. Yeah. Dang. Wow. That's good, man. And then, like you said, it is just a different uh, flavor of toxicity. It could be mm -hmm. manifested right. in a fleshly, you know, sense, or it could be in, in all internal. Um, and I think yeah. we, we all get some of that, you know, in different stages of life. But um, I think it's interesting that you, you called the book permission to, to be imperfect, right? I mean, you could have called yeah. it grace and mercy, or you could have called <laughs> right. it you could have called it redemption is for everybody, yeah. or you know, stop running so fast. God already ran the race, you know, whatever you wanted to yeah. call it. So, how did you land on? And we're gonna do something else in a second that I, I'm getting ahead of myself, but I'm just curious what how did you come up with the name permission to be imperfect? It it started as a message that I preached going through my story and really going through that verse I told you from John 1, 29 of behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And you can replace that word sin with missing the mark. You can replace that word sin with flaw. You can replace that word sin with imperfection. And that's what I did because, as I said, there was so much in me that I thought was wrong. Even after I was saved, you know, the enemy, that's all he's got. Mm -hmm. He studies our weaknesses and he he reminds us of our weaknesses, of of why we can never be, shouldn't be, can't be loved and can't be used and, and all of those things. So it was my imperfections that he was constantly reminding me of. And it was what Jesus did on the cross, taking those things away, mm -hmm. not not necessarily uh, at all making them go away or making me deny that anything exists, any imperfection may exist, but making me realize they don't define me anymore. Right. That they don't mean anything about me anymore because yeah. Jesus crucified the the consequence of them. He crucified the meaning of them. He crucified and killed them on the cross. So that was that was the essence of where I came up with permission to be imperfect. It was yeah. the cross has rendered my imperfections meaningless. So I have permission to be imperfect. I have permission to be a work in progress. I have permission to be yeah. me, to, to really be loved who I am as I am and let God do whatever he's going to do from there. Yeah. And Paul says, you know, too, to boast in our weakness because he's, right. you know, because he's strong. And so, um, and, and I just, this just hit me too, because I, I'm always on this, uh, kind of a, 
a kick about what do new Christians do? I know discipleship is important. You got to have people to walk alongside the people once they say the prayer, walk the altar, whatever they do, and and become in this they're in this new family, right? This weight's lifted. They feel different. Um, mm-hmm. But I've always had this heart to see them be able to fight in the spiritual because let's face it the target gets bigger at that moment the day they commit their life to christ guess what now they're on somebody's radar and that somebody is (laughs) the guy in the red leotard and the pitchfork right um but he doesn't show up that way so i think your (laughs) app is cool too and that's what I, i mean that just hit me like this is one of those things I've been looking for and I, and it's been out 10 years and I just found it <laughs> like last week. And, and I don't know, maybe it's timing, maybe it's God, I don't know, but I, I think it's worth sharing and I'm definitely going to do my part oh, thank you. to get it out there. Um, because new Christians, man, they quit, they quit the game if they fail enough times at it. And if they hear yeah. the voice that you're talking about enough, they're going to start believing it and then they're going to, they're going to quit. Yeah. Right. I almost did. I almost did. I was going to say, what had it not been for, for the truth, you know, the, the enemy is defeated and we say that, and he, he really is defeated. I go through it in the book. I mean, one of my favorite verses is Colossians 2, 14 through 15, which says that at the cross, that, that he was made a public spectacle of march naked through the streets is how the message paraphrase puts it. And it actually gets at the heart of, of the, the cultural thing that Paul was describing. It was called a triumphal procession where a Roman army that was victorious would take their enemy leader after they captured him, would strip him naked of his weapons and his clothes and march him through the streets to show the people, listen, he's no longer a threat. You don't have to worry about him. You don't have to fear him anymore. So Paul is describing the moment of the cross and the enemy's defeat as that kind of thing where Mm -hmm. Jesus stripped him. I mean, he's toothless, he's clawless, he's powerless, Mm -hmm. but he can whisper and he can shout and he can get into our minds and get after us with all this slander and all this deceit and all these lies. And that can be powerful in our lives and can cause us to want to quit. Mm-hmm. So you you don't behave the devil away, you believe him away. Mm-hmm. You take truth to him. And that's that's what this app does. It, it puts truth related to whatever human thing you're dealing with, whether it's loneliness or financial struggle or fear, depression, anxiety, lust, you name it. It mm-hmm. gives you truth related to those things so that you can truth the devil away. Right. And- right. That's great. No, it's good. I I think that's a very um I mean it's useful not just for new Christians, but I think that's that's the people who are most vulnerable mm-hmm. in that very um uh, impressionable stage of their Christianity and their their spiritual life. Um they're very impressionable and and so I think it's a good tool to escort them through those first, but also for seasoned Christians, obviously, because um, sometimes we don't always know where to go to find truth, mm-hmm. right? right? We know certain scripture or we're behind a, a minivan that's got a bumper sticker that has John 3.16 <laughs> on it, but we don't yeah. always know where to go in 2 Corinthians 10, 3 through 5, right? About spiritual warfare and and flesh and blood. We're not fighting a war, you know, uh carnal war. We're we're and we can take a thought captive and those kinds of things. So I don't yeah. think all new Christians know, but it, your your app gives them a place to go. Um so I want to do something real quick. I, I I'm gonna cut this part short. I do this with everybody and I call it life sentence and I want you to complete a sentence okay. that I give you. And oh it's boy, all right. Perspective. Yeah, it's your perspective, but it's what we're gonna take it wherever you and it's more than one word. You can elaborate, you can unpack okay. it, you can go wherever you want. Um I'm gonna ad lib on this first one because I see what I typed in here and it's been a little bit since I typed it, but I'm gonna I'm gonna <laughs> pivot a little on it. Um Okay, some of the resistance I get to the philosophy of strive less, stress less is. They believe that I am giving a license to sin. They believe that I am saying that there is nothing that you have to do in Mm. Christianity, that you can just be lazy, and there's this fear that People are then going to stop growing, and as I said, they're going to run amok with sin, therefore. Mm. Well, the last part of that that I left out was sinless, so maybe they Mm -hmm. need to read the title a little further. (laughs) Um, Okay, that's a good one. That's a good softball. Um, Let's let's make it a little—let's go a little deeper here. Um, 
Blank is an indicator that we are trying to please God with our performance. Stress. Really? Say stress and shame and guilt are indicators that we're trying to please God with our performance. Absolutely. Yeah. And did was this magnified at any particular point in your life um, where maybe you caught yourself doing that more often than another time? Oh, yeah. Did someone yeah, have to did. point that out or... Well, it was, it was, I mean, multiple times really, but interestingly enough, the, the more I was trying to work my spiritual disciplines or the more I was trying to serve, the worse attitude I ended up having Mm. (laughs) and the, the worse I ended up treating people because I was making my life all about following these disciplines and following these rules. And I was getting worn out trying to do it. You know, mm-hmm. burnout, for example, everybody's talking about burnout these days now that we're in this post-pandemic time frame. And burnout is just the the process of expending a lot of effort and getting nowhere. Mm-hmm. And that's really what it was for me. I was expending a lot of effort to try to prove something that Jesus already proved. I was spending a lot of effort to get him to love me, to get him to forgive me, to win this victory when the truth is I already had it because of his victory on the cross. So it was causing me stress. I was running on a hamster wheel. And because you're stressed, you have a short fuse. And so you treat people worse and you have a worse attitude. And then that also impairs your judgment. And so you end up doing worse. So it doesn't lead anywhere good, which is why I say all throughout the book, Mm -hmm. this do more, be more type of mentality ends up making you worse, not better. Yeah. And and then I wonder if you have any naysayers that might throw faith without works is dead in your face or, you know, those <laughs> oh, kinds yeah, of things. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So talk to me about that. Maybe a little like, where could we get confused with what you're saying versus what the Bible was saying there? Uh, and yeah. what are we taking out of context? Oh, that that's, that's a great, um, great scripture you bring up with the faith without works. And really you, you look at any new Testament um, rule, or I guess you could call it command or something right. after the cross and just about every one of them, including the faith without works, when you put it in context, has to do with loving people. Mm. It has to do with God's law of love. So mm. that's what that is about. Good. And of course, you know, um, if you know God's love for yourself, it's going to naturally, without you even really having to strive for it, it's going to naturally flow out of you. Yeah. Um, no, that's good. But, and I, let me let me interject there because I, the reason I asked that is, and I'm glad you said that because. To your point earlier of when you were serving, you had like a worse outlook and your frame of mind was toxic, but you weren't to the point of faith, meaning faith without works is dead, meaning loving people. Had you had a heart that was serving out of love for others, right? Instead of out of That have been different. Right, right. Like now, I mean, obviously I'm doing something. I'm in ministry. I, I work, Right. I mean, all the time if I want to, because there's always something more to do. But I'm doing it out of knowing that I'm loved. And so there's a delight and there is a, it doesn't make it always easy. Yeah. But but there is a fruitfulness that comes from it. There is a reward that comes from it. And I tell people that grace doesn't mean no effort. It means no earning. That's and right. that's the key. That's the key. key. You can serve Huge. just as the Apostle Paul did. I mean, he called himself a servant of the Lord. Huge. We are servants of the Lord. We serve God, but we don't serve him to try to get something from him or earn something or prove something to him or twist his arm so maybe he'll bless us. We do it from the position of knowing we are already good with him because of the blood of Christ. Yeah, We are already loved by him. And that just, there's... You know, grace is kind of like being oiled, you know, a well-oiled sure. machine. There's just an ease then to whatever it is that God asks you to do, because he will ask you to do things, right. but there's then an ease to it, and you can do things with joy and peace and with a good attitude. Yeah. So then what do you say to the first group of people that come to mind when I think about your book is the Catholic Church? And I'm not I'm not coming at Catholics at all. Yeah. Um, so that's my background. You, yeah. But wouldn't you agree that I mean, the majority of their doctrine would be box checking, correct? Like a lot of those ritualistic routine tradition, and then I go into a booth and tell some guy what I did, and then I walk out with kind of a clean slate. I guess my 
where do they miss? Where are they missing it? I mean, I, I know they believe in the same God we believe in and all that, but I, I'm just where where could we have you I had those conversations? To, uh, with oh, the, oh <laughs> I've yeah, I've I've had those conversations. I've had those conversations with my own family. I mean, really, yeah. that's a whole separate part yes. of my story is getting them to be okay with what I'm doing. I mean, they're still very, very much into their tradition, but I do know that now, I mean, I've been born again, 16, since 16 years old now, you know, for, for more than half my life now. Mm -hmm. But the first, first part of that was very tough in the household because they didn't get me and I wanted to show them what they were wrong with on everything. Mm -hmm. So I was shoving things down their throat and that didn't help anybody either. But I can say that now today here for the last 10 years or so really since definitely since I've been in ministry, they've, they've been supportive, even if, mm -hmm. if they don't understand everything. But I think whether it's in Catholicism or evangelicalism or whatever brand of Christianity, this box checking mentality often comes, one of the places it comes from at least is having a wrong idea of who God is misunderstanding his character. Mm. When you, when you see God as, mean or even half love half mean um when you fear him in that way like he's an angry god then you are going to think that you better do everything that he is asking you to do otherwise he's going to mm -hmm. smite you or get you back and mm -hmm. that's what i heard growing up in the religious schools that i went to and even god bless my family they didn't know any better they were just passing along what they had heard too but they would say things like oh you better not do this or you better do this otherwise god's going to get you back well mm -hmm. when you have that idea that god is up there that is like making his list and checking it twice you better make your list and check it twice too, because otherwise you are in danger of living under an angry God and you just never know what he's going to do to get you back. Wow. So for me, what was very freeing for me is realizing that the picture the New Testament gives us of, of God is Jesus. He is the full picture. Apostle Paul said that he is the fullness of the Father in the flesh. He is the visible image of the unseen God. Jesus said, if you've seen the Father, or if you've seen me, you've seen, seen the Father. Yeah. And John said, here's what he looks like, unfailing love and faithfulness. That's pure grace that you can depend on. So, yes, we have this idea from the Old Testament of, of God being wrathful and angry and all of that stuff. But there are reasons for it. I go through that in a chapter I call Get a New God in the Book of why the Old Testament portrays him that way. But what we get to live in now which really gets you out of this box checking stress and strive to try to please God mentality is knowing who he really is because of the cross. Yeah. He's good. Yeah. He's love. He's pure grace. It's good. Well, I always, uh, or uh, frequently I'll equate how we viewed our earthly fathers is to mm. how we view the heavenly father. Did you have more of a, I mean, growing up in, you said, I believe, a liturgical background. Did you have sort of a dad that, and obviously they said those words to you, you know, if you don't do this, this and this and this. So yeah. did that obviously impact the way you viewed God early on? Yeah, yeah, for sure. I yeah. mean, my 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 father's a good father and and he um he was just raised in a family, same with my mother, really. And I think it was part of their, um, we talked about my German background. Both of them have that German background. and But I think it's just part of the generation that they grew up in. It was a war generation. His grandfather was in World mm -hmm. War II. And they just didn't talk about things and they didn't show emotion so much. Mm -hmm. So I didn't have, I, I knew they loved me, but I wasn't told it all that often. And as far as like physical affection and things like that, you know, you didn't really see it in the household and mm -hmm. it really wasn't given, even though they were attentive to, I've got three older brothers to my, my brother's lives and they did the best they could with, with what they knew to do. And mm -hmm. they're, I mean, they're, I think they're trying to make up for things now because they've come to, to realization as, as any, any parent does that they're, they haven't been perfect with things. Uh, but but so that was I think part of um, part of me wrestling with the love thing mm -hmm. was that 
and the other part was that again i had all of this sense in me that i was someone who was wrong that all of my imperfections required all this fixing and so god couldn't love me mm -hmm. unless all of that stuff was was fixed so yeah it, it, it was just, it, as it is with most people's lives, it's this cocktail of things mm -hmm. that the enemy uses that's unique to each of us, Yeah, that he uses to give us this distorted view of God and this distorted view of what God wants that puts us into religion in one form or fashion mm -hmm. or looking for love in all the wrong places. For sure, yeah. And um, I wonder... You know, as you're talking, I was writing this question down because I didn't have it in my, my outline, but I think it's it would be kind of cool. I don't usually ask this question of authors, but since it was like literally this is a snapshot of your journey um, and helping other people kind of sidestep a few landmines that you maybe stepped in occasionally, what was the favorite, your favorite part? of writing this? Like, did you finish a chapter? Mm -hmm. Was there a chapter you finished and you kind of put the pen down or, and you were kind of like, man, that one, if I quit right now, that was worth it right there. Or, or did you have uh, some yeah. that maybe as you're writing? Cause if you're like me and I'd podcast and, and I, I'll say something that was like God talking to me using me. Right. So were you being ministered to as you're oh, writing? Tremendously, and, tremendously so me, ministered to. That's a two part to. question. So give yeah. me your favorite part of the book that was the most fun. Tremendously to write. ministered to writing, you know, I guess the secret of preachers and authors, and you know this as a as a podcaster as well, is is in in our preparation, we're probably helped more than anybody. Yeah. And, you know, I obviously I'm writing a book and you you've got to go to your publisher with an outline and all this, you know, tell them where where you're you're headed. And so I had a lot of content and knowing where I was going, but you know, you're, you're sitting there and, and my routine is I, I wake up super early in the morning at like four o'clock every morning. And then I get into, I do my workouts and, and uh, my Bible reading and prayer and all of that. But, but by eight o'clock I'm sitting at my desk and from eight to like noon I'm writing. And in that, that moment, sometimes, you know, you know where you're headed, but you, you kind of don't know at the same time. And it's like, okay, God, you know, it's it's yeah. me and you. Let's do this thing. And you are frankly very surprised at what comes out. I mm. mean, s some days are easier than others, obviously. Yeah. But I will say every every book that I've written so far, I have reached a point where it's like, I feel like I'm at the end of myself and I don't know if I can say anymore. And part mm -hmm. of it I just think is 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 the exhaustion, the labor mm. of it, of, right. of, because I'm not given all that much time to write a book usually. I mean, it's like sure. four or five months. And so that requires you to be at it every single day. Yeah. So you, you, like anything, you do that enough and, and you, you get exhausted. Um, and so in this book in particular, there, there was a point about a little over halfway, I would say, uh, maybe three fourths into it where I had hit a wall and I had really tossed out actually a chapter or two that I had written and it just wasn't what I thought was working, wasn't ending up working. And I just didn't sense the spirit on it. And so I'm like, I have learned, I think over now three books before this, that I follow peace. And so if, if, if there's not peace on when I finished a chapter, then it's yeah. not finished yet. And yeah. while I'm writing, you know, th there's just the sense. I don't know how else to describe yeah. it. And so uh, that's where I was, and I was I was really wrestling. And it's the chapter that I think it's called the ground of growth, and it's where I I go through my story of. I think I was telling my high school youth group when I was going back to talk to them so many years later, of how for many years I thought that the Christian life that the ultimate goal of Christian life was to be better when I learned that it's really to allow yourself to be loved. And so that chapter there was a very raw chapter that I wrote really at the end of myself at that, at that point and not really knowing exactly where it was going to land and what it was going to look like. But at the end of it, I was very proud of what God and I did through that because I feel like it's very relatable to people and it's very yeah. raw and vulnerable. So yeah. I I have 
since I started ministry, since my encounter there at the cross, which was a very vulnerable moment for me, I made a decision that I was going to be as open and honest as reasonably possible in my life yeah. so that I could come down to the level of struggling people because I think that's where real ministry happens. Right. We've gone through the the old age of preachers where they felt like they can't share any of their struggles or any of their vulnerabilities. Mm-hmm. They've got to look like this man that's got it all down. I don't I I think this generation wants authenticity for sure. And I think that's where real ministry happens. So I was proud of that chapter the ground of growth. It's I don't know if it's chapter that's 8 good. or 9. Uh, because of the authenticity, the vulnerability and the message of love that came out of it. Yeah. Well, and so if if you're looking at today's society and men listening to this, I mean, I talk a lot about helping guys grow spiritually as the leader mm-hmm. of their home and then all the other kind of branches of that tree that go along with biblical manhood and masculinity mm-hmm. and and guys yeah. really kind of stepping into that role that let's be honest culture is kind of resisting right yeah. now um yeah. and and really kind of Sadly, uh, yeah. turning it upside down right the definitions um yeah. and and what it looks like and what they're accepting of so when you see guys out there you talk some about what's called the good christian syndrome um do you see guys in church or what do you see guys doing in church that make you think that that's either very prevalent where guys are just kind of khakis you know fully pressed button downs you know penny loafers guys doing the good christian syndrome deal where is that versus kind of the the strong doesn't have to be rugged, but let's just say for the sake no. of comparison, rugged guy that loves Jesus. Where's the, where's the, I don't know, where's the dichotomy there? Yeah, I, I define good Christian syndrome as anybody that is engaged in some sort of discipline that they think that discipline in and of itself is what makes them good. Mm. So that could be. I've got, and I've been part of these groups, I've got accountability partners that I meet with, yeah. whether it's in person or text or phone, whatever, that makes me good. Or I am reading my Bible X number of pages or minutes a day, that makes me good. Or I'm spending more time with God. You hear that a lot. How much time are you spending with God? And so more is never enough after a while, but mm-hmm. people think that that's what makes me good. All of those are good things, of course. I'm not discouraging Bible reading or accountability partners or any of those things, but Jesus is who made you good, not your amount of anything, not how you look, not what you do. It's Jesus that has made you good. The blood of Jesus is the only thing that can make someone righteous. So so that's that's kind of my answer to the good syndrome, good Christian syndrome thing. But I would say you know, masculinity, manhood, I mean, it, it, it looks like being true to who you are in Christ. Mm -hmm. And I think that that looks different for different people because this isn't cookie cutter Christianity. I mean, the faith isn't, we all have different personalities. Mm -hmm. We have different styles. We have different stories. I'm five foot seven. There are, guys I stand up to that are, you know, much taller than me and I mm-hmm. feel like a shrimp next to. Mm-hmm. They're stronger than I'm. Th- this body, I mean, I have worked it out as much as I can to the point of injuring myself and mm. this 5 foot 7 frame is only going to allow me to work out to a certain level. So so I can only get so rugged looking really. Right, but right. I have had to be okay with who I am and yeah. my uniqueness. And and that is what this even this concept of permission to be imperfect has allowed me to do is allowed Mm. me to stop the comparison and realize, okay, I can't be that, that rugged looking macho man Christian, but I can be me. I can be the person that God designed me as knowing who I am in Christ. And I'm just as strong as somebody that looks strong. So I think it's, it's lean into God's design for you. Mm. And, And what you will find is that, so many people are looking for purpose and world-changing purpose, and they're buying books, and and they're going through the 12 steps to purpose. And I say it's a whole lot easier. Purpose comes out of who God made you. 
It comes out of your personality, your style, your story, your talents, your passions. Those didn't come from the devil. Those came from God. Mm -hmm. Lean into those things, whatever they are, lean into those. And purpose just starts to flow naturally without having to strive for it. Yeah. Because God has put in you and he's made you from your stature to your personality to so much about you. He's made you the person that he needs for this moment in time. In yeah. you is something that this world needs. Maybe not that previous generation, but he's put something in you that this world needs. And he's made your body according to what this world needs too. So yeah. don't despise it, maximize it. Yeah. And, and your imperfections are even a part of it. He's redeemed right. those in Christ to give you a story that can be your unfair advantage because it will relate you with people and give you the opportunity to show God's power and your weakness. That's good. I think that's true masculinity and manhood is the ability to say, you know what, I'm I'm weak, but he is strong. Yeah. Well, so then take us one step further because your book talks about striving less and stressing less. And I can see where if we do what you just said and we align with God's design, right? And then we align our gifts and talents with what we're passionate about and serving a particular need that's out there. And when those collide, like we're right in our perfect current of yeah. our mission and our purpose. And I could see where we would would not be striving so much because it would just be a natural thing. And then it flows I out could see yeah. us not stressing as much. How does that equate to sin less? <laughs> How does yeah, that? Because th 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 there's a spiritual and a scientific thing that I go through in the book okay. of that. The spiritual thing is, I, I, I take it mostly from 1 Corinthians 15, 56, which is Law empowers sin. See, mm. for years, I thought, and when I talk about law, I'm not just talking about the law of Moses and the Ten mm. Commandments. I'm talking about any must do, have to do, don't do, even self-help principles. If they become, I better do this or else, or God's not going to be happy with me, that is a law. And as the Apostle Paul says all throughout the New Testament, when we put ourselves under law, we go where law was meant to lead us, which is to the end of ourselves, to 2 Corinthians 3, 7. He says it produces death, frustration, condemnation. It's Law is meant to show you that you're imperfect, you need a savior. Mm -hmm. Rules, rule keeping is going to lead you there every single time. So you put yourself under more I have to do's. Mm -hmm. You're only going to realize your imperfections. You're going to realize your need for a savior. They empower failure. They don't keep you from failure. That's what I had to learn over the years. I thought climbing the ladder of rules and disciplines was going to help me be better, when in turn, they only prove that I need a savior. Mm -hmm. But there's a scientific thing that also happens, and they've studied this in sports, for example. Every sport, the more you perceive is on the line. The more you think you have to do, the more you think the stakes are high, the worse you do. Basketball players, for example, miss far more shots in a game than they do in practice because of the pressure. It's the same reason why, why people that were well studied for a test miss questions that they knew, or yeah. why people forget the name of a person when they need to remember it at the moment they need. It's because your body goes into this danger mode because it's under pressure because it's not designed to be there and it shuts down your critical thinking it shuts down your judgment it impairs your behaviors because your body is going into self-preservation mode mm -hmm. see we were designed for grace first chapter in the book i talk about i take it all the way back to the very beginning back to the the garden of eden before there was ever sin it was a place of grace that's where our bodies are designed so we naturally do better we think better. We think clearer whenever we know that nothing's on the line, that we are loved regardless. It doesn't make mm -hmm. us want to go run amok with sin. It actually makes us want to do better. And so we end up, when, when we know that there's grace and we know that we're loved, we end up being holier more automatically than we ever are by striving for it. And that's sinning less. Ooh, that's a good explanation, man. That's that hits it from all angles. I like that a lot. Um, because yeah, I mean, you can really, I mean, just as an analogy, you can just take the air out of a room whenever people are walking on eggshells around you because you're this uns, you know, 
unstable, like volatile personality, and maybe you're in a bad mood, right? Dad's in a bad mood, so don't come downstairs or whatever. And <laughs> same with, you know, if we think, A, yep. if we think God's always in a bad mood when it comes to us, right? We're 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 gonna be stressed. And you're then gonna be we're walking gonna turn, on eggshells. Yeah. yeah, and we're gonna turn to outlets that make us less stressed, which it are, you know, maybe not the exact sin you're talking about, but it, it sin is is Something. what it is. It's, yeah. Yeah. yeah, you're going to be looking for escape or coping mechanisms. Yeah, yeah. And that never leads you anywhere good. No, no. So it, it, it sounds so backwards to people that knowing that you're unconditionally loved is actually going to make you better. But that's what worked from the beginning. When you think of Adam and Eve, it, it wasn't their fear and guilt and shame that did anything good. That caused them to hive. It was God pursuing them out of mercy, giving them that covering out of mercy that brought them out. David commits. Yeah adultery with Bathsheba. Yet he goes on to fulfill his calling and he says it in Psalms, oh God, I know your precious thoughts about me. I know how unfailing your love is. Mm -hmm. The prodigal son, he's out there doing yep. God knows what. Yep. And it was his reminder that his father is good that made him go back home. Not my dad's mad and I better shape up. It was that yep. God is good. I am loved. So it's love. It's knowing that you are loved, knowing that you're welcomed home at any time. That actually right. makes you do better, not the opposite. That's right. That's good. That that takes the pressure off. Um, yeah. So, all right. Well, I feel like we just scratched the surface on this book, but I, I mean, I look at the time and I feel like it went really fast. But um, I've enjoyed. What well, is there anything maybe that you? I don't want you to walk away going, man, I wish we would have talked about this. So is there one thing that you think might just, aside from what we've already talked about, I mean, I know you, you've covered a lot, but is there anything that we didn't cover that you're, you're not wanting the audience to miss out on? I think we, we covered so much. Uh, yeah. And I think it was a very rich conversation. So yeah. I, I appreciate that, John. Uh, very good. I would just say when it comes to, when it comes to, the Apostle Paul talks about lust and lies and anger and all of the things that none of us obviously want to do. But mm -hmm. his answer to all of those things is not do more, be more, try harder. It's put on Christ. Mm -hmm. That's a word in Greek that is in duo, where we get the word endowment from. That's a gift of grace. It's, it's not doing anything. It's believing. It's knowing who you are. And I say, when you sink into who you are in Christ, that you are loved, that you are forgiven, you are made new, made right, made whole, made holy. The more you get your believing right, it's right believing that produces right behaving that produces right living. A lot of us are battling because we have it the other way around. We're trying to behave our way into right believing when you believe your way into right behaving. So focus on the mind. That's where the enemy goes after. That's where the battlefield is. And that's what then your beliefs trickle down and affect your right. walking and your talking. Get your believing right, and it starts with knowing that you're loved. That's good. Yeah, great way to put it. Great finish on that. Um, tell us where to get your resources, uh, where to find you. Um, I know you do some speaking, so yeah. um, maybe the best way to track you down and, and reach out. Yeah, my website is kylewinkler.org, and I'm on all the social media platforms, so you'll find me YouTube, Instagram, Facebook. TikTok, all of those. You'll find my videos. The app is in the sh the app store. Shut up, devil. Just type it in. You'll find it there. Yeah. And yeah. All right. This good is good deal. Well, that's been uh, that's a wrap, I believe. Thank you for being here. Uh, it's been good to meet you. It's been good to hear. I love the app, by the way, and I'm gonna definitely promote that as much as I can. Audience, with that, he's been in the one and only Kyle Winkler. We've been last in line. Be blessed. <laughs>